My name is Jamie Shulston. I'm a STA dual trainee in anaesthetics and intensive care, slowly crawling my way to the end of training in October. <clears throat> and essentially, I'm going to be a, a poor man's Jake Turner today. Uh, I've been asked to fill in his trauma slot and, and, and have a chat about a, um, an article that I co-wrote with both the Dave Evanses in the department and also Anthony Simons, who's a, uh, an ENT and head and neck consultant at NUH on the initial management of blunts uh, and penetrating neck trauma. <clears throat> um, so acknowledgements, obviously, um, I, I, we've already alluded to the other authors, but um, they, they came with a really broad range of experience. Um, uh, uh, NHS uh, Dr. Dave Evans um, is one of our uh, uh, sort of difficult airway um, uh, an ESIS with an interest in difficult airways and, and does regular ENT lists. Um, the other Dr. Dave Evans has got an extensive military background and, and he sort of brought lots of interest, uh, interesting facts to the table from that perspective. And then we invaluable really in writing the article was, was uh, Mr. Simons lending his perspective um, from, a, from a surgical point of view. So a few declarations of interest and health warnings. Probably the most important declaration of interest is I don't really pretend to be an expert. I still haven't finished my training yet. Um, uh, I have managed a number of patients with patients with both blunt and penetrating neck injury, both as, a, as an anaesthetic trainee and also when I was under delusions of grandeur as an ENT trainee, uh, which is a long time ago now. Um, uh, but I think between the, uh, particularly from the uh, consultants that have been had input into this um, this paper, we've, we've probably got about a level of um, expert guidance. Um, the uh, way that we wrote the, the paper and the sort of message from messages from this presentation are really around suggested ways of doing things and focusing on the principles of the, doing things rather than trying to be really didactic. Um, as more than anything else, I, I find if you try to be really didactic with anaesthetists, they'll just ignore you. But if you suggest to anaesthetists how to do something, they might actually um, follow the advice. There are also a few graphic images in the presentation. Um, I, I stuck them in because this is a presentation later in the morning and I thought you all might all be sort of um, starting to, to to slump into a bit of a coma so it's going to wake you up but if that sort of thing upsets you please maybe log off the call and go and have a cup of tea or something um, uh, just because I, I, I don't want that to ruin your day. Um, so why talk about this? Interpersonal violence sadly is increasing since um, England, uh, England and Wales started recording data around interpersonal violence has been 47,000 uh, 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 offences involving a knife or shot object. That was just in 2019 prior to the pandemic and that's been going up year by year. Um, <clears throat> probably one of the most important things from an anaesthetic perspective is the way that we, that some of the principles around managing the airway are a divergence around uh, from conventional airway guidelines, particularly from a difficult airway society. And we'll explore that a bit more as I go through the talk. Um, and I found those those guidelines were a real crutch to me as I've come through the training, as it's something both in exams and in real life, I'd say, well, I'll just do this because this is what the guideline says. And actually there's elements of that that can potentially get you in more trouble. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And then within the umbrella of blunt and penetrating neck trauma, um, there are slightly nuanced differences um, about how you might manage the two. And so we kind of wanted to bring that out in the article. I'll talk a bit more about that today. So, so firstly some gentle anatomy, hopefully this won't bring back nightmares from medical school. Um, uh, this is a, a cross, an axial cross section through the neck um, uh, at the level of C7 um, and I just want to pick out a few bits that are relevant clinically. So firstly the platysma muscle which you can see on the, the bottom hand of your screen, sheet like layer of muscle that goes from pec major to mandible and the reason that's important is any penetrating injury that, that is deep to platysma really warrants further investigations and can't really be written off as a kind of innocuous thing that can just be dealt with in ED. The other things that I wanted to draw, draw out from this were some of the fascial layers that you can see um, enclosing some of the structures uh, within the neck and the, and the neck is essentially just a conduit of, of um, the aerodigestive tract, the neurological structures, um, uh, muscles and blood, blood vessels going from the head to the thorax is probably the best way to think about it um, and there are a number of those are enclosed in um, vascular, uh, sorry fascial layers um, and they are continuous both superiorly in, and inferiorly and that becomes of relevance particularly in pharyngeal or esophageal injuries where you can get leak of, of gastric contents uh, and that can present you know days down the line as that as that infection secondary to that has spread into the mediastinum 
Um, so it's just something to be cognizant of. And then the next bit of anatomy that I'm going to talk to you about is, is zones, anatomical zones of neck injury. Um, so this was first described by Monson and colleagues in 1961. Um, and the way to think about it schematically is how each zone contains different anatomical structures. So zone three is from um, basically skull based to the angle of the mandible, zone two is the angle of mandible to cricoid cartilage, and then zone one is from cricoid cartilage to the inferior, uh, and the inferior boundary is the clavicle. So um, why is this useful? Uh, um, uh, Mr. Simons and I did a podcast for the BGA and he, he said something that I really liked on that, which is um, this provides a common language, particularly when these patients initially pitch up in an emergency department and often you're talking to a specialist that isn't present at the bedside. So if you're talking to a head and neck consultant somewhere, being able to say that they've got a zone one, two or three injury shares a common language and a common understanding and can start to give you an initial idea about some of the anatomical structures that might be at risk from a penetrating injury um, within those zones. However, um, uh, there is there is limitations. It doesn't like um, really take a genius to realise that the trajectory of an injury, for example, with a long knife or with a gunshot wound, could could happily go through more than one zone. So just because you have an entry wound in one zone doesn't exclude damage to anatomical, anatomical structures in, in other zones. Um, and the zone with the highest level of, of morbidity and mortality is zone one, and that's because of the density of vascular structures and the proximity. Um, to the uh, to the thoracic cavity. Um, so first gory image. This is from our article. This is a patient. It's it's obviously shared with their their consent from from looks after an NUH. It shows a zone one injury, um, um, which you can see by the letter B that had penetrated. Uh, it was a stabbing injury that had penetrated the common carotid artery. Um, and it sort of demonstrates how uh, what might look like a slightly innocuous wound can still have fairly devastating um, uh, devastating effects and that, that a, a breach to the platysma really does warrant surgical exploration. And A um, is demonstrating where there's been a surgical repair of the common carotid artery. So um, I'm now going to talk through blunt and penetrating neck trauma in sequence. And I'm going to use the um, kind of well recognized A to E approach um, and talk about E each in in its own right but, but this being an anaesthetic presentation I'm obviously going to focus more on airway assessment and airway management um, with some a bit of chat about the other bits and pieces. So in terms of airway assessment with someone with blunt neck trauma what you're really trying to identify is someone that's got a threatened or obstructed airway um, and then you need to be coming up with a rapid plan um, about how to manage that. So things that might suggest that that's, um, that's going to be a problem. You can think about mechanisms of injury, particularly clothesline injuries, um, red flag symptoms such as stridor or dysphonia would be really concerning. Uh, and then red flag examination findings, stuff like hemoptysis and a rapidly expanding neck hematoma are, are fairly, hopefully you'd think were fairly obvious. But um, surgical emphysema of, of the neck can actually be a bit more insidious and often the patients won't report it. And if you haven't you know, gone to actually examine the patient and look for it, you might not find it, but that is a really concerning finding and really warrants explanation about why, where is there an air leak? Why is there an air leak? You know, what do we need to do about that? Um, so once you've made a decision that a patient is, needs to have their airway secured, um, you need to come up with a plan for that. And the first thing to discuss really are the principles around that plan that we recommend. So that this needs to be a multidisciplinary plan, ideally. And whilst it's likely that you will have an anaesthetist, uh, an anaesthetist at the bedside of a trauma patient early, it's highly unlikely you're going to have an experienced head and neck surgeon at the side of the bedside. So that needs to be mobilised early um, because it's likely that they might not even be on site. Um, and certainly within QMC, it's worth flagging that you will probably need to call both ENT and MaxFax because you don't know who's on call for each speciality. It might be that you've got the Professor of Autology on call for ENT or the TMJ special, um, specialist on for MaxFax. And you need to get the you need to get the individual with the best skill set for that patient at the bedside as early as possible. Once actually planning your management strategy, the overriding principle is you need to visualise the anatomy before you instrument. And we'll talk a bit about how you can do that either surgically or from an anaesthetic perspective. And the idea is that you're not going to pass anything blindly that might disrupt hematoma, restart bleeding or create a false tract uh, uh, or um, worsen surgical emphysema or something like that. Um, 
And the other thing to think about is that the, the, the difficult airway society guidelines definitely need modification and not all elements um, of it appropriate. For example, cricoid pressure is much more likely to make a laryngeal fracture worse. Um, there's debate around that anyway, which I won't explore in this presentation. Um, uh, cr generating positive airway pressure by, for example, bag, my, ma bag mass ventilation um, uh, prior to you having uh, a endotracheal tube or some kind of tube cuff distal to the level of injury stands the rail the very real risk of making things worse potentially by dislodging um, hematoma or uh, worsening surgical emphysema which can distort anatomy further so it's something that we quite strongly don't advise unless clinically it's really needed because of, of hypoxemia um, and conventional front of neck access is likely actually to worsen an already damaged anatomy and it's really not recommended in this setting by an anaesthetist you should that should really be done by an experienced ENT surgeon um, and we can talk a bit more about that um, in, in a moment. So moving on to airway management um, you've decided that this patient with blunt neck trauma needs to have definitive airway match what options are available to you well we've re we broadly broke it down into those that are able to cooperate and those that are not and in my experience um, of the patients I've managed actually the vast majority of them haven't been able to experience because their blunt neck trauma has been part of a number of injuries including uh, um, concomitant head injury and, and for whatever reason the, these strategies haven't been appropriate but, but assuming that they have got more of an isolated neck injury what, what might you consider so awake fiber optic um, is certainly on the table uh, benefits of that you know they keep the patient spontaneously breathing um, it maintains airway tone to an extent. Um, uh, however, it can be prohibitively challenging for a number of reasons. There might be blood in the airway from associated maxillofacial trauma. You're going to need to maintain spinal immobilization in some in some way. Um, uh, and obviously, it's going to be difficult to sit the patient up. You'll be able to tilt the trolley up, but not necessarily sit them up if you haven't managed to, to clear the spine radiologically. Um, and topical anesthesia, with or without sedation, definitely carries the risk of worsening airway obstruction. And so you need to have a plan if, you're, if, that, if that happens about transitioning to, a, to, a, to the, next, the next layer of your plan, which hopefully we would recommend that's agreed prior to embarking on your weight fiber optic. And ideally, you've come up with a multidisciplinary plan um, before doing all of this. And that, that what well, we would usually recommend that's written on a whiteboard so that there's like a shared mental model of all the teams involved. And, the, you know, in the ideal world, you're moving um, slickly from one layer of that plan to another. Um, I do recognise that often for various reasons, including getting the right skills to the bedside and in terms of things needing time critical event intervention, that's not always possible. And that might be slightly divorced from reality, but if possible, that's what we'd recommend. The other thing that you can, can consider in an awake cooperative patient is an awake tracheostomy. Um, and this is quite a commonly strategy, used strategy in this setting. Um, uh, by some, some surgical authorities consider this the gold standard of airway management. Benefits including allowing direct visualisation of anatomical structures between the skin and intrachea. Um, help, it can help to stop bleeding uh, when, if, that, if that's identified. And a tracheostomy is considered safer than a surgical cricothyroidotomy by our surgical colleagues, as it offers a more definitive airway protection, and it's certainly safer in the context of laryngeal separation. However, it is often technically challenging, especially with spinal immobilization, not allowing for that degree of neck flexion. Um, and I just want to show this video is more for like the um, more for the trainees that haven't seen many awake fiber optics in their time. Let's Slightly gory, look away if that's not your cup of tea. So why have I shown you all that, that horrible video? The reason I've shown you that is that was very much my concept of what an awake fiber optic, uh, sorry, an awake tracheostomy was like before I'd seen one. Um, when I was earlier on in my training, I assumed that some kind of battle hardened head and neck surgeon was going to turn up. They were going to bosh everyone out of the way and get this airway in within 60 seconds and everything was going to go away. And that was always going to be my crutch and my get out of jail free card, if whatever the anesthetic plan um, was had, had gone had gone awry. Um, 
those of those of you that have seen awake um, surgical tracheostomies uh, uh, probably have got a different experience. The four that I've been involved with all took mm, 10 minutes or more before we got a definitive airway in, which is which is I'm not claiming is slow. Um, but certainly if you've got a profoundly, profoundly hypoxemic patient, it's probably too long, realistically. You'll probably have a cr critically hypoxic brain injury by that stage. Um, and so the reason that I show that video um, is a recognition of the importance of getting the right skills at the, right, at the bedside at the right time um, and um, preparing as much as possible and facilitating your surgeon as much as possible. Because even an experienced surgeon will find this highly stressful. It's going to be anatomically challenging. Um, so having the right uh, equipment open, potentially having an experienced scrub nurse that's familiar with the equipment, considering pre-prepping the neck, uh, um, uh, localising with anaesthetic before you embark on your anaesthetic strategy, so surg the surgical fields are all things that might save bits of time. So it's just, just some thoughts for you there. Um, so if they, moving on to if a patient has got blunt neck trauma but need and needs a definitive airway but are unable to cooperate, which is, to be honest, the majority of the ones that I've looked after, We'd recommend some kind of highly modified rapid sequence induction. Um, and really, again, the, the principle is to try and visualise the anatomy before you instrument it. So either direct or video laryngoscopy um, to visualise the anatomy down to the level of the glottis and, and looking at the superglottis. With regards to which, we would say whichever you're most familiar with, don't pick something up that you're not familiar or haven't had much training in, in what is likely to be a highly stressful um, situation. Um, again, avoid bag mask ventilation for the reasons I've already uh, talked about, unless hypoxic and no blind bougies. Once you've got to the um, uh, got to the level of the glottis, we then recommend um, inserting a uh, intubating bronchoscope with a tube already on the bronchoscope. So a combined approach. That tube should really be small. Maybe, re for example, a reinforced size six. Uh, if you can get access to a Parker tip, they can be quite helpful. So it's got a curved tip on it, just to reduce the chances of when passing that tube causing further damage to airway anatomy or restarting hemorrhage. And then you will visualise the anatomy using the airway bronchoscope down past. Uh, the vocal cords, navigate past any damaged anatomy. Really helpful to record this if you can, especially if you haven't managed to get an ENT surgeon to the bedside so that you can describe and they can see any damaged anatomy um, when they get there. And then um, securing a tube with a cuff distal to the level of injury. Um, and as I've mentioned, um, having uh, a, a, the, if a surgeon is there and that's your backup option, um, having that as prepared as possible. So going on to further assessment, moving away from airway, C-spine will require immobilisation realistically until radiologically cleared. Obviously, it's a risk-benefit decision and there's a high level of debate amongst the trauma literature about the benefits of, of C-spine immobilisation, its lack of evidence base. And really what we said was um, if a patient got having is, is having life-threatening hypoxemia due to your inability to adequately position the head, they would go on to have a hypoxemic chiliac arrest or a devastating hypoxic brain injury. Realistically, that's a kind of risk-benefit decision-making. From a ventilation breathing perspective, it's really important to assess for life-threatening thoracic injuries, especially if they're a polytrauma patient. And unfortunately, penetrating neck injury, uh, so blunt neck injuries can um, uh, lead to, um, to tracheal damage all the way down to bronchi and you can get bronchial disruption which is really a subject slightly outside of this talk but it's something to think about if you've still got ongoing air leak. From a circulation perspective, on blood loss from isolated blunt neck trauma is, is rare actually um, uh, so it should really prompt you if the patient still hypoten is, is hypotensive arch reduction should be considering looking for sources of blood loss elsewhere or other causes of hypotension. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, a neurogenic shock from a spinal cord injury. And then from a disability perspective, trying to look for localising neurology that could reflect a, a stroke from blunt cerebrovascular injury could be helpful before induction. And it might lead. I mean, it's likely that you're going to have um, a CT scan, but it might mean that in addition to your trauma series CT, you protocol for aortic arch up to um, uh, the, the cranial vault looking for blunt cere cerebrovascular injuries. Uh, so moving on to penetrating neck trauma, in terms of airway assessment, um, uh, again, looking for hard signs that the airway is going to need securing. So hard signs of either vascular or aerodigestive tract injury, for example, with expanding hematomas, bubbling, sucking wounds, surgical emphysema. Um, the reason I put this picture there is not just to wake you all up, but uh, uh, if you do have 
a retained foreign body such as a knife or a shank in the neck um that is ideally not removed in in the recess department ideally your patient has an airway secured either in recess or in theater their neck is explored and it, it, it's removed by a surgeon in theaters it can can restart massive hemorrhage and if needs be that they, they can go through um the scanner with with a, a retained foreign body um so if you have again had made a decision depending on your clinical assessment that the patient needs to have their airway management uh, airway definitively management the principles are very similar to what i discussed in blunt neck trauma with a few caveats to it and um, so uh, if there is a large open wound that communicates with the trachea use it like you can and we'd usually recommend not doing that blindly again getting a, a, a small reinforced tube, uh, going through the deficit into the trachea with a bron bronchoscope so you can see where you're going, you can see where your tube's going up, but that's completely reasonable. I've not done that. I know there are experienced people, there are experienced people within NUH who have done that. Um, again, if they're cooperative, you could consider uh, either an awake fibre optic um, versus a, a awake tracheostomy for, for similar reasons. Um, uh, and if not cooperative, the highly modified RSI, uh, in ensuring you visualise before you instrument. Um, within um, penetrating neck trauma, what, what is interesting though is cervical spine immobilisation is far less of an issue. Um, it's, it's much less common to have um, cervical spinal cord damage in penetrating neck injury. And actually to the extent that routine immobilisation is not recommended, as it can impair adequate assessment of entry and exit wounds uh, and the initial management of ongoing bleeding from those injuries. So the US East Trauma Guideline recommends that immobilisation should only be done in a penetrating neck injury where the method of injury is compatible with a spinal cord or column injury and there's evidence of a neurological deficit or you're unable to rule that out because the patient's subtunded. So typically that would be some kind of combination injury, often with a blunt injury as well, for example, uh, a blast injury or a high speed road traffic collision with incursion into the cabin or, or objects flying about the cabin that have caused a, a penetrating neck wound as well. So in terms of further assessment from a um, ventilation breathing perspective, you need to definitely need to exclude and manage pneumothoraces and hemothoraces, especially in zone one and two injuries where you've got that proximity to the thoracic cavity. From a circulation perspective, you're much more likely to have major hemorrhage um, from penetrating neck injuries, uh, and that's going to need to be managed. And what we talk about in the article is if you have got major hemorrhage, what you really need is a sub team that can deal with that, that can deal with vascular access. They can they can deal with a ma major hemorrhage protocol, calcium, tranexamic acid, or, you know, TEG, whatever, all that stuff. It really needs to be managed by a separate senior team um, so that the uh, anaesthetist that's initially there doesn't have to kind of split their cognitive bandwidth between re two really complex tasks that are, are time critical. You really need to have two anaesthetists, optimally two ADPs that can, can manage that. Depends on the resources that you've got available. Um, fortunately in NUH, we're, we're, we have the luxury often, we, we are able to do that. Um, a, a bit more about circulation. So in terms of ongoing bleeding from, from neck wounds, um, the initial recommendation is fairly simple. It's direct pressure with some sterile gauze. Um, however, if that doesn't work, you can consider uh, inserting a 20 gauge Foley catheter uh, um, along the wound tract until you meet some, some, some light resistance and then slowly inflating that with saline. And sometimes if that's helped, surgeons will stitch the wound around that uh, in order to create hemostasis, potentially get through a scan and get to theatre. Um, uh, and then in terms of disability, uh, optimally, you would try and have some idea of their disability before you um, uh, intubate and, and perform an RSI. Um, obviously, zone three penetrating injuries have got the highest risk of brain injury and, and cranial nerve damage. In terms of ongoing treatment, any patient that's physiologically unstable or those with, with hard signs of upper airway digestive tract or vascular injury should really be urgently transferred to the operating room. There is um, uh, and that, that should really be done prior to sort of pit stopping in a CT scanner. There is a, there is debate around that. And obviously there's going to there's going to be senior decision making from major trauma and potentially from uh, your head and neck surgeon about the benefits of, of going through a CT scan. And that that may become more relevant if they have multiple injuries and the neck injury isn't the most life threatening one. But if you're talking about a penetrating neck injury in isolation, really, they need to go to theatre because they're going to need to have their neck explored. Stable patients or those with soft signs of injury are much more controversial. 
um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, there were management algorithms that basically recommended mandatory surgical exploration of all breaches to the platysma within certain zones of injury. Um, that has now evolved slightly and is more nuanced, and it's being re replaced by something called a no zones approach um, with use of early contrast CT scanning and then a more individually tailored management. Um, as, as they have started to demonstrate some good outcomes with more conservative management, interventional radiology uh, has, has evolved more in terms of what they can offer. Um, and if I'm honest, I think that approach of, of early, early CT scanning, if there isn't something that's time critical that needs to go to theatre, um, probably reflects our current practice for major trauma um, in other anatomical regions. Um, so in summary, which I think keeping me just about to time, uh, a to E approach as per European trauma course or ATLS, close cl collaboration between um, anaesthesia and surgical teams uh, and the wider trauma team, major trauma, etc. cetera, um, visualise before you instrument um, and in an awake cooperative patient, an awake fibre optic or uh, an awake tracheostomy are probably your best options. Um, so I just like to give everyone an opportunity to ask some questions and whilst those are being asked there's a QR code that will get you the article that we wrote there there's a PDF on a Dropbox account.